Ladies and gentlemen, last week I discussed the branch of philosophy called metaphysics, the study of the fundamental nature of reality. I said that the metaphysical base of objectivism is the recognition of the fact that reality exists independently of man's consciousness, that reality is an objective absolute, that it exists independent of whether any consciousness perceives it or not, that everything which exists possesses identity, meaning that that which is, is what it is, and that consciousness is the faculty of perceiving that which exists. This evening I will discuss the nature of man's consciousness. First, man's cognitive faculty, and then a brief discussion concerning the nature of the subconscious and the nature of emotions and their relation to reason. When I speak of man's cognitive faculty or of cognition, I refer to the faculty and process of understanding, of grasping, of apprehending the facts of reality, of learning that which is true, in a word, of acquiring knowledge. The branch of philosophy that is concerned with the nature and means of human knowledge is epistemology. Epistemology deals with such questions as, how does man acquire knowledge? What are his means of perceiving reality? By what criteria is he to judge the truth or falsehood of his conclusions? To be conscious, man must possess a means of consciousness. That is to say, he must possess some means of perception and awareness. Consciousness is a faculty, and the faculty cannot be exercised without specific means. A consciousness without means of awareness is a metaphysical and logical contradiction. To be is to be something. Consciousness, like everything else that exists, possesses identity. It is a specific faculty that operates by specific means. Let us now turn to a consideration of that means. The source of all human knowledge is the evidence of reality provided by man's senses. Uh, sensation is the state of awareness produced by a physical stimulus transmitted from sensory receptors along nerve cells to the brain. It is the state of awareness, for instance, which is produced by light waves striking the retina of the eye, or sound waves striking the membranes of the ear. Sensations constitute the mind's first contact with reality. A sensation is the primary material out of which all subsequent knowledge is built. But a sensation as such is not knowledge. It is only the material of future knowledge. Discriminated awareness begins on the level of percepts. Percepts constitute the actual starting point of human knowledge in the sense that percepts are man's first fully aware cognitive contact with reality. What is a percept? Well, borrowing Miss Rand's definition, a percept is a group of sensations automatically retained and integrated by the brain of a living organism. Man's knowledge begins when, at the start of his life, he integrates the evidence of his various senses, sight, touch, sound, etc., into the perception of objects, of entities, of things. Perception begins when he is able to perceive and distinguish entities, chairs, tables, trees, people, and so forth. I have said that percepts constitutes the real starting points of man's conscious perception of reality. Percepts are the given, the self-evident. The knowledge that percepts in fact consist of integrated sensations 
is acquired by man much later. It is a scientific conceptual discovery. Man is not ordinarily, if ever, aware of sensations as such. What he is aware of is the result of the integration of different sensations into perceptions, as we have already seen. For example, when you look at an object in this room, now as an adult, you perceive it instantly and automatically as an object. If you look at a lamp, you perceive it immediately as a lamp. You are not aware of the sensory material of the separate sensations that your brain had to integrate in order to make you able to perceive this. You would find it extremely difficult and probably impossible to break this percept up into the, or break it down more precisely, into the various separate sensations of which it is composed. The sensations of color, shape, texture, etc. As an adult, you are aware of the fact that you see a lamp and you know that it is a sense organ, the organ of sight which makes it possible for you to see. But your eyesight alone does not give you the perception of this lamp. Your eyesight gives you only the visual sensations which your brain has integrated with other sensations into the percept of a lamp. If you want an example on the adult level of how sensations are integrated into percepts, consider the process by which one becomes familiar with a new piece of music, such as a concerto or a symphony. The number of sensations registered in the brain when you hear the music for the first time or for the twentieth time is the same. But observe that on each success of replaying you hear more and more. On the first hearing, you can discern perhaps only one or two themes or melodies. But gradually you perceive more. You perceive how one melody grows out of another and how the various themes interconnect. This is accomplished by the gradual integration of separate snatches and strands of sound into more complex patterns. So that given the same sensory stimuli, you end up by perceiving subtleties and interrelationships that escaped you in the beginning. The first act of integration performed by a human consciousness, the integration of sensations into percepts, is performed automatically by man's sense organs, nerves, and brain. We can observe that a similar automatic integration is performed by the brains of the higher animals, and that they too are aware of reality by means of percepts. But the next step of awareness is not an automatic process. It is the step that only a human mind can take, the step that leads to the level of awareness proper to the consciousness of man, the conceptual level of awareness. In a basic introductory course such as this, we can only touch upon some of the broad fundamentals involved in that very complex subject which constitutes the epistemology of concept formation and the nature of concepts and abstractions and so forth. The full objectivist statement of the nature of concept formation is to be found in Miss Wren's monograph entitled Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, which originally appeared in a number of installments in The Objectivist and was subsequently published by The Objectivist in booklet form. In my very brief discussion of the subject which is to follow, I will borrow very heavily from Miss Rand's formulations in this monograph. To begin with, let us begin to clarify the meaning of a concept. A concept, quoting Miss Rand, is a mental integration of two or more concretes which are isolated according to a specific characteristic and united by a specific definition. Now let us elaborate on the meaning of this formulation. A child, for example, observes that tables have a similar shape, which is different from the shapes of all the other objects around him. He focuses on this distinguishing characteristic. He isolates tables from all the other objects, and he classifies them mentally into one group or class. A little later, he learns to designate this group, this kind of object, by the word table. 
The mental process required to form a concept is the process of abstraction. To abstract means to take out, to isolate a particular characteristic from all the other characteristics of an object and to consider it separately. In the process of forming concepts, there are two acts which are basic, isolation and integration. Isolation and integration are the essentials of the process of forming concepts. The process consists of observing the similarities and differences among things, of abstracting the similarities as distinguishing characteristics, of isolating similar things from all others, and of integrating them into one group, into one concept. A concept stands for an unlimited number of concretes of a certain kind. For instance, the concept table includes all the tables that now exist, all the tables that ever existed, all the tables that will ever exist. The first concepts a child forms are concepts of entities, such as table, chair, man, etc. He learned subsequently to form concepts of attributes, of action, of relationships, and so forth. For instance, to form the concept of an attribute such as, oh, let's say the color green, the child observes such instances of green as, say, green grass, green curtains, a green dress, a green rug. He abstracts the attribute they have in common, namely their color. He isolates that color from all others and integrates it into the concept green. Let us pause for a moment on the meaning of the word attribute. An attribute is an aspect or characteristic of an object which can be isolated and identified conceptually, but which in fact cannot be separated from an object and cannot exist by itself. For instance, you can consider the length, the color, and the weight of an object separately, length, color, and weight being attributes, of course. But length, color, and weight do not exist by themselves. There are no such separately existing things as length. There are only long objects. There is no such separately existing thing as, say, redness. There are only red objects. Thus, the concept red would be defined, in effect, as a color attribute of objects, not as a thing called redness and existing apart from red objects. Starting from the first level of concepts, which identify perceptually observed concretes, Man forms higher levels of concepts which represent wider integrations. For instance, he integrates the concepts table, chair, bookcase, bed into the wider concept furniture by observing the characteristics which they have in common and which distinguish them from all other objects. Then he integrates the concepts furniture, dishes, rugs into the still wider concept, household goods. Then he integrates the concepts household goods, buildings, transportation vehicles into the still wider concept man-made utilitarian objects. Or he integrates the concepts man, cat, dog, bird into the wider concept animal. Then he integrates the concepts animal and plant into the still wider concept organism or living entity. The process of abstraction and concept formation works in two directions. To unite concrete objects into wider abstractions and into wider, more general classifications, or to break up abstractions or break up concepts or classifications into narrower subdivisions, narrower abstractions, narrower concepts, narrower classifications. For example, you might start by forming the concepts of man, animal, and plant, 
then unite them into the wider category of organisms, that is, living entities. Or one might start by forming two very wide categories or concepts, living things and inanimate things. Then break up the concept of living things into narrower categories such as man, animal, plant. The process of learning, of expanding one's knowledge, uses both methods constantly. For instance, in the early stages of the science of biology, a scientist may integrate certain living entities into the concept animal. Then he subdivides the concept animal into the subcategories of mammal, bird, fish, reptile, etc. With further knowledge, and observation, each of these subcategories is divided into many, many more subcategories, which in turn can be subdivided and so on. To quote from a lecture given by Miss Rand at NBI on the nature of concept formation, quote, Concepts pertaining to man's consciousness, such as thought, memory, emotion, etc., are derived from the data of introspection. Consciousness is the faculty of awareness, the faculty of perceiving that which exists. Awareness is not a passive state, but an active process. Two fundamental attributes are involved in every state, aspect, or function of man's consciousness, content and action. The content of awareness and the action of consciousness in regard to that content. For instance, when you see a woman, the action of your consciousness is perception. When you observe that she is beautiful, the action of your consciousness is evaluation. When you experience pleasure or approval, the action is emotion. When you draw conclusions about a character, the action is thought, etc. To form concepts of consciousness, one isolates the actual content of a given state of consciousness by a process of abstraction, then integrates it with similar actions experienced on different occasions and different contents. In regard to concepts of consciousness, one must always remember that there is no such thing as a thought or a feeling that exists by itself independent of the living being who experiences it. There is no such thing as a thought or a feeling without content. The most complex category of concepts represent integrations of existential concepts with concepts of consciousness and designates combinations of physical and psychological actions, as for instance, marriage, property, justice, law etc. Close quote. For a more detailed treatment of this subject, I again remind you to read Miss Rand's monograph, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Okay now, to continue our discussion, let us turn briefly to the role of language. It is by means of language that man retains and designates his concepts. Language to quote Miss Rand's definition, is a code of visual auditory symbols that converts abstractions, that is, concepts, into the mental equivalent of concretes. Language substitutes one symbol, one word, for the enormous sum under a concept. Remember that every word we use with the exception of proper names, stands for an unlimited number of concretes of a certain kind. Words enable man's mind to deal with such broad, complex phenomena, such as matter, energy, freedom, morality, which no mind could grasp or hold if it had to visualize all the perceptual concretes represented by such concepts. Concepts and language primarily are tools of cognition, not of communication, as many people assume. Communication is a consequence, not the primary purpose of concept formation. 
The primary purpose of concepts and of language is to provide man with a system of cognition, of classification and organization, which enables him to acquire knowledge on an unlimited scale. This means to keep order in man's mind and enable him to think. However, to fulfill this function, language must be exact. Otherwise, neither thought nor communication is possible. Thought can be no more precise than the precision of the tools it employs. When a man thinks, writes, or speaks, he must know clearly and specifically what his words denote. He must know that the meaning of words is not to be switched from moment to moment at his arbitrary wish or whim. He must know that if a jailer decides to call the process of torture re-education, this will not transform a concentration camp into a university. He must know that words are to be used objectively, that words stand for concepts, and that concepts refer to facts of reality. Now, a child does not start from scratch in discovering the process of concept formation. He starts by learning from his elders by being taught to speak. But even though a child does not have to perform the feat of inventing language, his mind has to perform independently the feat of grasping the nature of language, the process of symbolizing concepts by means of words. Even though a child does not and need not originate and form every concept on his own by observing every aspect of reality confronting him, his mind has to perform the process of differentiating and integrating perceptual concretes in order to grasp the meaning of words. If a child's brain is physically damaged such that he cannot perform this process, he does not learn to speak. Learning to speak does not consist merely of memorizing sounds. Learning to speak consists of grasping meanings of grasping the reference of words, the kind of things that words denote in reality. When the child learns to speak, he acquires the tools of thought. He rises from the perceptual to the conceptual level of thought, from mere perceiving to thinking. Thinking is not an automatic process. It requires an act of volition, an act of choice, a special mental focus and effort. A child is free to think or to evade. He can seek to understand or he can substitute imitation for understanding. He can organize and expand and keep on expanding his knowledge, or he can stagnate in a half-conscious stupor by confining himself to whatever half-grasped concretes and undefined words he has learned from others. I will have much to say on the subject of the choice to think or not to think in a subsequent lecture. What I want to stress and stress again and stress again is that the base of all of man's concepts, of all of that tremendous cognitive hierarchy which he builds, is the perceptual level of awareness which is the start of man's knowledge, which is the given, the self-evident. All concepts are derived from the perception of concrete specific objects. Concepts or abstractions as such do not exist. They are, as Miss Rand makes clear in her monograph, they are man's method of classifying that which exists, and everything that exists is a concrete. To be valid, a concept must be connected with and reducible to its base and perceptual reality. Now, on the higher level of abstraction, that connection consists of a long chain of concepts formed from earlier concepts, formed from still earlier concepts, and so on. In order to be grasped or used, every concept in that chain requires a precise definition. It is only by means of precise definitions that a higher level concept can be reduced or brought back or connected with its base in perceptual reality. In a subsequent lecture given by Barbara Brandon, there will be a discussion of some of the rules involved in correct definition. 
The subject is also taken up in considerable detail by Miss Rand in her monograph. In that monograph, I might mention, Miss Rand provides a more technical definition of the meaning of a concept than I am providing here. She defines a concept as, quote, a concept is a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristic with their particular measurement omitted, unquote. As I have already indicated, I am not here exploring the full meaning of this analysis of concept formation because it is too technical for this level of discussion. But for philosophy majors and those who desire a more advanced philosophical analysis of the problem, again, I refer you to Ms. Rand's monograph. Concepts are the means to an unlimited expansion of the range of man's consciousness. Animals are bound by the perceptual concretes that confront them at any immediate moment. The range of their awareness is as wide as the reach of their senses and no wider. But man sitting at a desk can chart on the back of an envelope the motion of planets through the outer reaches of space. Such in briefest possible essentials is the function of man's reason and such is the meaning of the objectivist definition of reason as the faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses. Now I want briefly to discuss an important principle pertaining to the proper use of concepts, a principle which men fail to grasp with disastrous consequences. Observe that man's knowledge has a hierarchical structure. A higher concept is derived from earlier concepts which serve as its genetic roots. For example, the concept orphan is derived from and presupposes the concept parent. If you had not grasped the concept parent, you could not form the concept orphan. The concept motion presupposes the concept entity or that which moves. The concept change presupposes the concept identity. If you had not grasped the fact of identity, you could not grasp or form the concept change. And this leads us to a very important principle. When one uses concepts, one must recognize their genetic roots. One must recognize that which they logically depend on and imply. Failure to observe this principle is what we call the fallacy of the stolen concept. This fallacy consists of using a concept while ignoring, contradicting, or denying the validity of the concepts on which it logically and genetically depends. This fallacy is rampant in modern philosophy. All the devices used by mystics and neo-mystics to convince man that the mind is impotent entail one version or another of the fallacy of the stolen concept. Let me illustrate a little of what I mean as follows. It is rational to ask, how does man achieve knowledge? But it is not rational to ask, can man achieve knowledge? because the ability to ask that question presupposes a knowledge of man and of the nature of knowledge. It is rational to ask what exists. It is not rational to ask does anything exist, because the first thing one would have to evade is the existence of the question and of the being who is there to ask it. It is rational to ask how do the senses enable man to perceive reality. It is not rational to ask, do the senses enable man to perceive reality? Because if they do not, by what means did the speaker acquire his knowledge of the senses of perception of man and of reality? Several years ago, I wrote an article for the Objectivist newsletter which deals with the issue of the stolen concept in more detail. It's in the January 63 issue of the newsletter, which is still available from the Objectivist, and I think you would find it worthwhile reading for a more fully elaborated discussion of this fallacy. 
Now let us proceed further. The enemies of reason attack man's consciousness from two sides. They attack the tools of man's knowledge, his concepts, and they also attack the source of man's knowledge, his senses. It is the validity of sensory evidence that all mystics and neo-mystics have invariably challenged in order to seek to undercut the validity of man's mind. I will have more to say about that argument next week. But I want to say here that all the doubts, confusions, and misconceptions about man's consciousness rest in large measure on a misunderstanding of the role played by the senses in the process of acquiring knowledge. The senses do not give us knowledge, they give us only the material of knowledge. Quoting from Atlas Shrugged, the task of man's senses is to give him the evidence of existence, but the task of identifying it belongs to his reason. His senses tell him only that something is but what it is must be learned by his mind. For example, you have all heard the argument that the senses deceive us or are unreliable because a stick is straight when it is seen out of water but looks bent when it is seen in water. The conclusion drawn from this is that our eyes are not a reliable guide to reality. This argument is an example of the fallacy of the stolen concept in that it uses sensory evidence in order to demonstrate the invalidity of sensory evidence. Further, however, the argument is a total misrepresentation of the role played by man's senses. The senses do not provide out-of-context evidence of reality. They provide the total of that which is sensorially perceivable. The explanation of the phenomenon of the stick in water is as follows. Light waves travel more slowly through water than they travel through air. Consequently, the part of the stick which is submerged in water appears at an angle to the part of the stick which is above water. Our eyes in this case are being damned because they provide us with the full context, the comprehensive evidence of everything within their range of perception. They give us not only the sensory evidence of the stick shape, but also the evidence of the motion and the different speeds of light through two different media. They give us the evidence, not the explanation. It is the task of man's mind to observe the phenomenon, to identify all its factors, and to explain it. Man's knowledge is not gained automatically. Concepts are not formed automatically. Identifications and explanations of this kind can be reached only on the conceptual level of consciousness. Man's mind is not infallible. His thinking is open to the possibility of errors. But man's senses cannot deceive him. They cannot distort the evidence. They cannot act willfully or causelessly. Senses are physical organs and as such are inexorably subject to causal necessity determined by the nature of the organ and of the stimulus. The message transmitted to the brain obeys an absolute rule of physical causal necessity. It is the task of man's mind to identify and to interpret that message. When errors occur, they are errors of interpretation and are made by the mind, by the reader of the message, not by the messengers. Now you might want to ask, but what if one's eyesight begins to fail? Doesn't it then give a distorted picture of reality? No, it does not. It merely gives you a less efficient, more limited picture, the exact picture it is capable of giving in its weakened physical state. It is then the task of your mind to observe that your eyesight is now less efficient, to discover the cause of it, and to acquire a pair of glasses. A very important epistemological error is the failure to differentiate between the perception of reality and the form in which reality is perceived. Many philosophers claim that man's perception of reality is not valid because it is influenced or determined by the nature of the sense organs. 
their argument goes as follows. When you perceive reality, you perceive it by means of physical sense organs. Therefore, what your mind gets is only an interaction between something which you can never see and the particular nature of your sense organs. If a man came from Mars with different sense organs, he would perceive a totally different reality. Now, what our senses do affect is the form in which we perceive reality, not the objectivity of our perception. For instance, when we touch a hot object, we receive a sensation of heat. Heat is caused by the movement of the molecules which compose the object. The slower the molecular motion, the colder the object. The faster the molecular motion, the hotter the object. If instead of the sense of heat, I had a sense which allowed me to feel the molecular motion of an object under my fingertips, and when I touched that object, I felt motion instead of heat, I would be perceiving the same reality, the same fact of reality that I had perceived before, but I would be perceiving it in a different form. And it would still be the task of my mind to interpret my sensations, to interpret and to learn the same fact but now by means of different data. Man has various senses which give him different forms of perceiving reality. And if I were to ask you at dinner, what is the real truth about this roast beef that I am serving you? Is it brown or is it hot? Well, you would say correctly that my question is absurd. Two different sense organs are making you aware of two different attributes of the roast beef. One, the speed of the molecular motion in the roast beef. The other, the manner in which the roast beef absorbs light rays. You are not perceiving two different realities. You are perceiving two different aspects of the same reality. Suppose that a Martian came down to Earth and that he had sense organs totally different from ours. Suppose that instead of eyesight, he was able to feel the vibration of light waves bouncing off objects to feel it as a physical pressure on his cheeks. Why then, he would be perceiving reality in a different form that we do, but he would be perceiving the same reality. That which we have to infer or deduce, he would perceive directly. But having sense organs different from ours, he would have to deduce that which we perceive directly. Certainly reality, the object of perception, would remain the same. Men, animals, and insects have different forms of perceiving reality and different ranges of awareness. But they do not perceive three different realities. They perceive the same reality in three different forms. Now consider the case of a colorblind man. He perceives reality as correctly as we do. Only there are certain differences in his form of perception and certain discriminations which he cannot make as sharply as we can. While we experience the sensations of red and green, he experiences two shades of color resembling brown, which are not as sharply differentiated as red and green. But he is reacting to the same vibrations of the same light rays. Only, since the structure of his organ of sight is slightly different from ours, his form of perceiving the same vibrations, the same facts, differ slightly from ours. Man's knowledge, full scientific knowledge, is conceptual, not sensory. Sensations and percepts are the material, the bricks out of which man builds the structure of his knowledge. Man's mind is blank at birth, in that he has no innate ideas. An idea is an identification of some aspect of reality. Man can have no knowledge of reality ahead of any contact with reality. What he has is only the capacity to acquire knowledge, the organs which will make knowledge possible. It was Aristotle who identified the fact that man's mind was blank at birth. In philosophy, this view of man's consciousness is symbolized by the famous expression tabula rasa, which means blank wax tablet. The mind is a blank tablet at birth, and the senses are the means by which man proceeds to write upon that blank tablet, to fill it with percepts, with concepts, with knowledge. 
The hatred of mystics and neo-mystics for man's mind is motivated by their rebellion against the fact that man's mind is tabula rasa at birth, in a word, that all of man's knowledge has to be acquired. That the responsibility of acquiring knowledge is man's. That knowledge is not granted to him automatically by revelation, without choice or effort on his part. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the tragedy of mankind is not that men are born tabula rasa, but that too many of them die tabula rasa, more or less. The amount of material that man can hold in the focus of his conscious awareness at any given moment is necessarily limited. He cannot think of ten different subjects at once. He cannot focus upon all of his knowledge while performing any one particular task. Where then is his knowledge? It is stored in his subconscious. The subconscious holds all of his past perceptions, identifications, associations, and conclusions on which his mind is not presently and actively focused. The storing of material in one's subconscious begins with the brain's integration of sensations into percepts. The ability to perceive objects or three-dimensionality or distance depends on integrations of sight and touch, which, once formed, are filed in the subconscious and function automatically in future acts of perception. The child learns, for instance, to estimate correctly a large object seen at a distance and not to perceive it as one inch high. These sensory integrations are not formed volitionally. They are the product of the automatic functions of the brain. Conceptual integrations, however, are the product of a reasoning process which the mind must choose to initiate. But conceptual integrations can become automatic once the mind has made them and has accepted them fully. For instance, a child has to use a conscious effort in order to learn to speak. But once he has learned it, his subconscious connections become automatic and he is able to speak without having to search or grope for words. All learning is a process of first acquiring new information consciously, then establishing automatic integrations and leaving one's conscious mind free to acquire further knowledge. As an individual develops, his subconscious filing system grows immeasurably, expanding the power of his consciousness. For instance, a physicist can grasp from a simple formula chalked on a blackboard the widest principles defining the action of matter and energy throughout the universe, without having to recall and retrace all the steps of the knowledge that makes his understanding possible. His subconscious functions, in effect, like an electronic computer, set and directed by his mind's purpose, providing his mind automatically with the context of knowledge it requires. The goal or purpose that a mind has set in any given instance determines what material will be fed to it from the subconscious out of the total store of its knowledge. Like an electronic computer, the subconscious requires precision of the orders it receives if it is to function efficiently. And if it is given contradictory orders, it will not function at all. The failure to solve a problem is often caused by the absence of a precise, unequivocal definition of the problem one wishes to solve. A mind's purpose acts in relation to the subconscious as a standard of selection, without which no thought is possible. When a mind abandons purpose, it abandons thinking, and what then drifts through it from the subconscious is determined not by logic, but by association. To the extent that a mind is active, that it maintains a state of full focused awareness, the ideas it forms are connected to one another by an act of purposeful integration and are filed in the subconscious in an orderly manner. To the extent that a mind is passive, that it initiates nothing but simply absorbs experience, such ideas as it forms are connected by chance associations 
for our files of the subconscious are separate miscellaneous items, like the contents of a grab bag. A well-ordered filing system is the hallmark of an efficacious mind. Man can file his conclusions efficiently and yet include a premise that is incorrect. But the orderly integration of his knowledge enables him to perceive his errors and correct them, whereas unintegrated beliefs can resist detection much longer. The rational integration of ideas requires full conscious awareness. The establishment of associational connections does not. In the course of his life, a man forms many inconsequential associational connections, associations that arise from the particular experiences of his life, such as the association of a piece of music with the person in whose company he first heard it. But if his thinking is to be efficient, these associations must be labeled as such, and neither confused with the process of reasoning nor made the emotional basis for spurious generalizations. Associations as such can be harmless. If an absolute distinction is drawn and held between the associationally connected and the logically connected. For instance, a man may be emotionally traumatized by the discovery of his red-haired wife's infidelity. But if years later, when he has long since divorced his wife, he finds himself obsessed with the feeling that any red-haired woman to whom he is attracted will inevitably betray him, he must recognize that this is neurosis, not scientific induction. The failure to think about, to identify and localize the cause of painful experiences frequently results in the formation of associations that are not harmless but calamitous. Such associations are filed mentally as conclusions and become the source of subsequent subconscious motivation, that is, motivation of which a man is not consciously aware but which influences or dominates his behavior. Another source of subconscious motivation is repression. Repression is not merely the failure to know some content of one's subconscious, it is the automization of a mental block that forbids a certain thought or idea or identification or evaluation to enter one's conscious awareness. If a man holds the implicit or explicit premise that that which his mind finds painful or that which clashes with his self-esteem is not to be perceived, then his subconscious will take the order literally, will tend to take the order literally, and no such forbidden thoughts will be allowed into his conscious awareness. Such repression, once instigated, continues to operate automatically and subconsciously. Forbidden ideas will tend not to be verbalized. Forbidden desires will tend not to be recognized. Forbidden emotions will tend not to be identified. They will continue to exist in a man's subconscious and to influence his behavior, a is A, facts are facts, and are not to be wiped out by self-made blindness, but they will be given no acknowledgement. For instance, a woman whose religious beliefs forbid it may not recognize that she desires her best friend's husband. She will not know why she avoids him, nor why she is irritated by her own husband's every action. Or a professional humanitarian may never allow into words the knowledge that what he feels at the sight of those who suffer and depend on him, is a sense of pleasure and power. When they develop neurotic symptoms, those who repress may cry that they are the helpless victims of their malevolent subconscious. But the truth is that the subconscious does not have a will of its own. It has no secret diabolical purposes. It is a machine run by the premises with which a man's mind programs it. And if men program their subconscious with contradictions, evasions, and self-destroying injunctions, they pay a psychological price calculated by the most ruthlessly logical of computers. To evade is consciously and volitionally to close one's mind to certain facts, to refuse to initiate a process of thinking in defiance of evidence that thinking is necessary. It is with evasion that most repressions begin. When a man evades, the first thing he represses is his guilt. The second, at least such as his goal, is the truth he believed he could negate by refusing to admit its existence. 
However, I do not wish to leave the implication that all instances of repression involve evasion or are necessarily motivated by immoral considerations. In other words, I don't want to convey an improperly moralistic approach to repression. You will find in Past Issues of the Objectivist a two-part article which I wrote entitled Emotions and Repression, which I think you will find valuable for an elaboration in much more detail of my views concerning this subject. I want here simply to put on the record the fact that repression can sometimes be in, uh, motivated by noble motives, by the desire to be moral or to do right, but that can lead to disastrous consequences nonetheless. And, and I will talk more about this with you in the final lecture of this course. Mental health does not require total omniscience about the contents and operation of one's subconscious, just as it does not require total omniscience about the external world. It does not require a full and total memory of every event and experience one's consciousness has ever registered, nor of every association and conclusion one's consciousness has ever made. But it does require the total absence on the conscious and subconscious level of any premise forbidding knowledge. It requires that man place no value above awareness, which means no value above the ability to perceive, the ability to be conscious. It requires that as he grows up, man learn to translate into language the subverbal conclusions made in childhood and test them against reality in the light of his adult understanding. And it requires that when man acts, his actions never clash with his conscious convictions. Now, let us turn from the psychology of the subconscious to a related subject, and that is the psychology of emotions. The greatest and the most disastrous source of confusion in epistemology, in psychology, and in the lives of most men is the failure to differentiate between cognition and evaluation, between the object which one perceives and the value which one attaches to that object. Both cognition and evaluation are functions of man's consciousness. It is the failure to grasp the exact nature of their relationship that is the greatest single source of man's tragedy, frustration, and evil. There is a causal relationship between these two functions. One of them is the cause, the other is its effect. If one regards this relationship in its proper order, one sets one's consciousness to the achievement of internal harmony, of self-esteem, self-confidence, mental health, fulfillment, and happiness. But if one attempts to reverse that order, to treat the effect as if it were the cause, and the cause as if it were the effect, as most people do, one opens one's consciousness to internal chaos, to guilt, self-doubt, neurosis, frustration, in a word, to a lifetime of misery. These two functions are thought and emotion. Throughout history, with very rare exceptions, most theorists have regarded emotions as an irreducible primary, as the prime mover of man's consciousness, as an active cause, and thinking as a passive effect. The most famous promulgator of this theory in our time is Sigmund Freud. Freud held that man is a creature helplessly, irrevocably pulled on the strings of emotions, drives, instincts, impulses, which are inherent in his nature and essentially impervious to thought, which he cannot resist but must attempt to satisfy in the most socially acceptable manner, and that this is the limit of his mind's power over his feelings. Freud stressed the weakness of the reasoning ego in man. He described a department of human consciousness which he called the id, as a vast reservoir that contains all sorts of cravings, impulses, instincts, desires, unknown to man, but much more powerful than anything else can ever be within his consciousness, 
And these desires, Freud claimed, are the actual rulers of man's life. Thomas Hobbes, a philosopher of the 17th century, wrote, quote, The thoughts are to the desires as scouts and spies, to range abroad and find a way to the things desired, unquote. He stated that the only purpose of thought is to help men to achieve their desires, and he did not specify where those desires come from. Another philosopher, David Hume, wrote, quote, Reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, unquote. Freud, as well as Hobbes, Hume, and all the other advocates of this theory, regard emotions and desires, in effect, as irreducible, as the given. It's just you and it's just there. How did it get there? They provide no answer. They regard emotions as primaries, as something which you cannot change or question, something to which you must adjust and must not indulge in unnecessarily. The standard of unnecessarily being the possibility of injuring your physical health or of giving offense to your neighbors, but something which will have to be forever the basic ruler of your destiny. Such is the view of the relationship between thought and emotion that is all too prevalent in our culture, a view that regards man's reason as the helpless tool of his emotions, and man as a helpless zombie possessed by unknown, unknowable, unaccountable, causeless, mysterious, emotional demons. Now, let us take a look at these mysterious emotions and see how mysterious they really are, or if they are, and let us consider further the relation of emotion to thought. An emotion is a response to values. It is an automatic psychological result of a man's value judgments. An emotion involves both a mental and a physical component. An emotion is the psychosomatic form in which man experiences his estimate of the beneficial or harmful relationship of some aspect of reality to himself. Not all of men's values are held in identified verbal form. Men can hold many things as values without conscious recognition and in defiance of conscious convictions to the contrary. Many of the values men select are clearly self-defeating and contradictory. But whether men hold their values consciously or subconsciously, rationally or irrationally, it is their concept of what is good for them or evil, what is for them or against them, that determines what they will love and what they will fear. Just as love is man's emotional response to that which represents his values, so fear is his response to that which threatens those values. Just as desire is the consequence of love, man's wish to achieve and possess that which he holds as his good, so hatred is the consequence of fear, his wish for the destruction of that which endangers his good. Just as happiness is the consequence of fulfilled desire, the emotion in man which results from the achievement of his values, so suffering is the emotion which results from the frustration or destruction of those values. An emotion is a response to some aspect of existence, to an object or event perceived in reality or perceived within one's consciousness. One can feel the emotion of love in answer to the sight of a person whom one values or in answer to that person's image within one's mind. One can feel fear at the experience of a physical pain signaling danger or at the anticipation of that pain within one's thoughts. One can feel guilt over an irrationality actually committed or over the desire for that irrationality. An emotion is a reaction to a perception, but the specific emotion one experiences is not determined merely by the nature of the object or event perceived. It is determined by one's evaluation of that object or event. For instance, three men may look at the same woman. The first man sees in her his own deepest values and feels love. The second man is blind or indifferent to her virtues and feels nothing. The third man regards her virtues as a reproach and feels resentment. Or three men may look at a scoundrel. The first man recognizes to what extent this person has betrayed his status as a human being and feels contempt. 
The second man wonders how he can be safe in a world where such scoundrels can prosper and feels fear. The third man secretly envies the scoundrel's success and feels a sneaking admiration. All three men perceived the same objects. The difference in their reactions came from the difference in their appraisals of the significance of what they perceived. An emotional response is always the reflection and product of an estimate. And an estimate is the product of an individual's values as the individual understands them to apply to a given situation. Differences in men's values come from differences in their basic premises, in their fundamental views of themselves, of other men, of existence. Consider the process of emotional reactions on a simple example. Suppose that you work in an office and the news gets around that the company is laying people off. You have not accumulated any savings, jobs are hard to find, and several of your associates have already been laid off. Suddenly you get a note stating that the boss wants to see you at four o'clock. Your emotional reaction is one of apprehension, anxiety, fear, at the prospect of losing your job. Then you walk into the boss's office and the boss says, Jones, I've been watching you for a long time. You're a good man. I'm very pleased with your work. So I'm going to give you a promotion and a raise. Your emotion changes instantly. You feel relieved, pleased, elated. The causes of your emotional reactions in this case are obvious. And if your co-workers knew the circumstances and had seen you look depressed when you went into the boss's office and look happy when you came out, no one among them would say, I wonder where emotions come from. Emotions are such mysterious things. Consider another example. Suppose that the door of this room suddenly flew open and a man burst in brandishing a machine gun. It is safe to assume that all of us would experience an immediate emotional reaction and that the emotion would be fear. It would happen so fast that one would experience it as if the reaction were automatic and as if no thought, no estimate, no knowledge were involved on one's part. But suppose that a two-year-old child were present in this room. He would not feel any fear at all. He might even giggle and want to play with the machine gun. Or if a savage were present who had never seen a gun before and did not know what it was, he would not feel the fear. He would have no estimate of the meaning of the gun. He would not know that it represented a threat to him. An emotion as such is involuntary. It follows an estimate automatically as an immediate consequence. Through the filing in the subconscious of past experiences, identifications, and values, a mind is set to register certain kinds of estimates in the face of certain kinds of situations without requiring the initiation of a fresh conscious process of thought. It is the speed with which emotions can occur that permits man to fail to grasp that their source is his mind, meaning more specifically his value premises. The process of automatic appraisal is made possible by the mind's accumulated premises that function as an integrated unit and sum up immediate involuntary estimates until and unless a new thought intervenes to revoke the order in answer to the mind's recognition that its old thinking is not sufficient to evaluate that which now confronts it. For example, a man who is in love with his wife will feel an emotion of love for her when he sees her or thinks of her, and that emotion will be automatic. He will not have to remind himself of his estimate of her character, of the virtues which he had observed and which were the cause of his estimate. But let him discover that she is deceiving him, that she is unfaithful, that she has none of the qualities he admired, and his estimate of her character will change. His new evaluation of her will automatically revoke the evaluation he had given to his subconscious, and his emotion will change. Instead of love, he will now feel hatred, or anger, or contempt, or pity, according to whatever standard of values he uses to judge her actions. At any given moment, a man's emotions are the automatic summation of the thinking he has done or has failed to do in the past. They are the product of the values and estimates he has established in his mind on a conscious and subconscious level. An estimate can be revoked and an emotion can be changed, but only by a new process of thought. 
It is man's capacity to hold contradictory values and thus to make contradictory estimates that permits him to experience contradictory or ambivalent emotions, to fear that which he desires, to suffer guilt over that which brings him pleasure, to resent that which he loves. But it is still from his values that his every emotion proceeds. It is man's capacity to evade his contradictions and refuse to identify his values that permits him to complain that he possesses feelings and desires for which he cannot account, and to cry that the source of his feelings is not his mind, but his instincts, his primitive urges, his archaic drives, just as centuries ago men sought to explain those impulses which they feared, condemned, but could not understand by the doctrine that human beings are inhabited by demons. For instance, an aesthete finds himself helplessly attracted to a brainless slut he professes to despise, and, evading the knowledge that he is indifferent to, or frightened by, any woman of mental stature, dreading the admission that what he seeks is proof of his masculinity, and that, by his standards, only a slut can give it to him, wishing never to know that that slut is the soulmate of his deepest values, of his secret self. He cries that his body is an instinct-ridden machine moved by desires unrelated to the content of his mind, and evades the question of why his instincts made that sexual choice for him and no other. Or a husband finds himself miserably bored by the meek church-going wife whom he has always regarded as the epitome of goodness, and, fearing to confess, that the virtues taught to him since childhood, the virtues of humility, resignation, and self-sacrifice, have never brought him joy, and that he can't renounce his desperate sense that life should have come to something more. And so he shrugs off his feeling with some meaningless utterance about human infirmity, with the precept that man by his nature must always fail his noblest ideals, and with the conviction that feelings are not to be explained. Torn by an unconfessed guilt over the emotions they believe they shouldn't experience but do, and over the emotions they believe they should experience but don't, the majority of men seek to evade the causes and to command their feelings in and out of existence by arbitrary injunction. They decide that it is desirable to feel a certain emotion, and they order themselves to feel it. They decide that it is undesirable to feel a certain other emotion, and they order themselves not to feel it. And, since emotions do not obey orders of that kind and cannot be altered by direct control, such men fail and then cry that emotions are impervious to the power of reason. They do not seek to resolve their contradictions. Unfortunately, too often they seek to evade them. They do not seek to revise their irrational premises, nor even to learn if they are truly irrational. They seek to repress the feelings which the premises evoke. They do not seek to understand too often. Instead, they seek to escape the knowledge that there is anything which requires understanding. But the failure or refusal to recognize the source of his emotions does not set a man free of their consequences. It merely surrenders him to their mercy. He finds himself moved by forces which he does not understand and which, therefore, he is powerless to challenge or to alter. Most men have accepted, explicitly or implicitly, the doctrine that emotions and desires are mysterious, irreducible primaries impervious to reason, and the consequences of this acceptance are written across their lives in the shape of frustration, helplessness, and suffering. Emotions are the most sensitive of sounding boards, reflecting the meaning of existence to the person who experiences them. If recognized and acknowledged as such, emotions can be an invaluable aid to self-understanding and self-improvement. By analyzing the nature and roots of his feelings, a man can discover ideas he has held without conscious awareness, values he has chosen without verbal identification, concepts he has accepted without thought, beliefs that represent the opposite of his conscious convictions. If he is troubled by emotional conflicts, he can resolve them by resolving the intellectual conflicts from which they stem. His mind and emotions are not antagonists, 
and what may seem like a struggle between them is only a struggle between two opposite ideas, one of which is not held consciously and manifests itself only in the form of a feeling. He can weigh these ideas, knowing that the task of his reason is to discover which is true and which is false, and when the discovery is fully integrated into the total of his premises, his consciousness will be restored to harmony. For a more detailed study of the psychology of emotions, I refer you to three articles which I wrote in The Objectivist. The first, entitled Emotions and Values, is in the May 1966 issues. The second, Emotions and Actions, in the June 66 issue. The third article, Emotions and Repression, appear in two parts, August and September 1966. What a man feels, what he desires, what he enjoys, is the result of his values. And his values may be rational or irrational, consonant with reality or contrary to it, healthy or insane. His values may be the product of his conscious rational choice, or they may be the product of his evasions, his repressions, his uncritical acceptance of the doctrines he was taught in childhood, or for that matter, his blind whim of the moment. What he feels in regard to any fact or any issue is irrelevant to the question of whether his judgment of it is true or false, right or wrong. What he feels proves nothing whatever about the reality confronting him. It proves only that he holds certain premises. Emotions are not tools of cognition. It is not by means of his feelings that man perceives reality. If in any issue you find that your emotions clash with your reason and you are tempted to reject reason, to act against it, identify what this means. Reason is your faculty of perceiving reality. To act against reason is to act against reality. To attempt the irrational is to attempt to make the impossible succeed. When you hear such prevalent bromides as the heart is superior to the mind, there is something higher than reason, men cannot live by logic, rational analysis kills, remind yourself of what reason is and then translate those bromides into their actual meaning as follows. The heart is superior to reality. There is something higher than reality. Men cannot live in accordance with reality. Knowledge of reality kills. I doubt whether you would accept those precepts in this form, yet this is what they do mean. Emotions are the means of experiencing the enjoyment of life. There need not be and should not be any tragic dichotomy between reason and emotion. There is such a dichotomy predominantly in the minds only of those who believe in one form or another in the substitution of emotions for the task which should be performed by man's mind, by his rational faculty to a person who recognizes that reason and emotion have separate functions which are not interchangeable, there need be no conflict between mind and emotions. Emotions, as I have said, are the means of experiencing the enjoyment of life, but they offer that experience only to the person who does not seek to substitute his emotions for his mind.